Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Welcome all of you. Amen. Back from our small groups. And again, as we gather back on campus, I want to welcome you. So glad to see all of you. We have our children's ministry and operations. Our young people are gathering. We pray God's blessings upon them. But it's so good to see each and every one of you back. And also, if you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. Thank you for being with us. Again, for the next couple of Wednesday, all the month of May, uh, every Wednesday in May, we're so privileged to have with us Dr. David Norris, who teaches at Urshan College and Urshan School of Theology. Again, I would consider him a theologian, and I am so grateful for the gift of teaching that God has given him. And uh, we have partnered with him. We've asked him, invited him to come. In fact, the truth be told, we've been trying to do this for quite some time. Last year, we tried to do it. His schedule just so busy. And but so we kind of said maybe 2024, maybe that would be the time. And he graciously accepted our offer. We're so thankful for this. You're in for a treat. I truly ask for you to be fully present. Get the posture of learning. Put yourself in a spirit of curiosity. You're going to learn something today. You're going to be strengthened today by the teaching and the word of God today. To help enhance this experience, there's a QR code that is going to be on the screen. And at any time during the teaching, you're welcome to activate that through your smart device. And if you would like to submit a question, and now I will tell you in a size room like this, we're not going to get to every question. But there is going to be a time when he is finished and that we will take as many questions as we can. And we want you to be informed. We want this to be a learning experience. We want our church to be better, stronger because of a month, just of a deep dive, just learning about why we believe what we believe, why it's important for you to trust that. And so we're grateful for that. Brother Norris, so honored to have you. Would you put your hands together as we welcome David Norris to come and teach. God bless you. It's uh, wonderful to be here. You may be seated. And uh, this is going to be a series of uh, five Wednesdays, and it's going to track with a, a book that I've written uh, called Big Ideas, uh, which I would have to sell, but I don't have to sell tonight, but I'll, I will bring some next week. So, uh, I, yes, that's what's going to happen. Uh, I was teaching, and... Uh, it was a long weekend, and I was uh, exhausted, just uh, emotionally exhausted, heading back home. And I got on the plane. You ever get in the plane in those middle seats, the dreaded middle seat? And uh, that was me. And the way I retreat is I put a big, fat book in front of my face and uh, try not to talk to anyone. And they, if they talk to me, I nod. I, I know it's not very Christian, but that's, that's what I do. So this guy that was in the uh, window seat, he was kind of nodding off. But the guy in the aisle seat uh, kept acting like he wanted to talk to me. And uh, I said, good book, huh? Yes, it's a, it's a good book. Flip page. Kept talking. He says, well, what's it about? Well, then I just used a bunch of big words because I thought that would throw him off. But it didn't deter him at all. He said, oh, yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, he used big words back at me. I go, oh, boy. Turns out uh, he was a, a Baptist pastor, and uh, he was from Atlanta. And he asked where I was from, St. Louis, uh, where do you teach? And Finally, he dug it out of me that I was a teacher at a, a, a seminary. Well, what seminary? It's Pentecostal. What Pentecostal? United Pentecostal. Oh, United Pentecostal. I've heard of you. He said, in fact, I've got a question for you. Uh, we rented our gym to uh, a UPC youth group, real nice kids. And... Um, one of the girls came up to me, and she said something to me. I, I, I just want to know what you think about it. I said, okay. What'd she say? She said that unless I speak in tongues, I'm going to hell. Is that true? Is that what you believe? So then I decided this was going to be a longer conversation than hello, goodbye. 
and I better get to know this person. And then I just took away all my pretense. So tell me about yourself and this and that and tried to be friendly. And uh, what you like pastoring, this and that and all that. And so we kind of got on a better footwork. But, but he really did want to know. He didn't want to argue. He really wanted to know what we believed. And so uh, I told him, and uh, that's the basis of this book. It's called Acts 238, and the whole conversation takes place on the airplane, and it goes back and forth to this and that story, and that I think we got about six or seven copies in the bookstore, so you can probably get that one this week. So I want to uh, talk to you about some basics of what we believe. Uh, go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, and uh, we'll talk about that. Ephesians 2, 8, it says, uh, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. And in order to explain what that means, I need a married couple to volunteer to come up to the platform and be seen by the world. Uh, and you could be married 100 years or two years or just last week. It doesn't make any difference. If you can get up the stairs, you qualify. So they're coming by the thousands, by the hundreds. Uh, I'll, I'll just let you, this simmer for a seal a moment. Okay, we've got a volunteer, Brother and Sister McManus. Thank you for coming. This is such a wonderful church, helping each other cooperate and do all these things. I just happen to have both their children in my class, so they may be watching. Who knows? Uh, all right, so uh, you've been married for, this is some trick questions. You've been married for how long? Over 24 years. 24 years. Okay, didn't even look at your wife to confirm that. That was, that was great. And then uh, you, when, when did you first meet? 1999. And what was that? How'd you meet her? Uh, probably a school project. School project? Do you agree with that assessment? No. Okay. <laughs> How do you believe that you uh, met? At work. At work. Is that a, I don't know what that means. At work. Oh, at work. <laughs> I thought it was a new outreach program or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So did you get interested in her first or her you, or was it like mutually love at first sight? Or Certainly probably coming from me first because she was so much, you know, higher level. So I... That is such a great answer. You are a good, good husband. <laughs> is that your recollection as well? Um, probably because I was dating his best friend. Okay, I didn't know I was going to get into all this. This is was not part of the operation. All right, so I want to liken how God reaches out to us with this grace. And so I'm going to use this as an analogy. So you're interested in her, and that's going to be analogous to God being interested in us. That's grace. All right, so God reaches, and he's grace. Now, some people think that God only gives grace to a certain number of people. You've probably seen that tulip analogy. Maybe you haven't, okay? Then we won't talk about that. There was no response to that. Um, but some people that believe there's limited atonement, that God is so great that if he calls you, you have to come. So it must be that God only gives grace to some. But the truth of the matter is that God gives grace to everyone. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says um, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his will. Um, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says the grace of God appears to all men. So again, grace appears to all men. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4, it's, it, it, it speaks concerning Christ, and it says who desires all men to be saved. So uh, God is wooing uh, the world. He, 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 everything he does is for redemptive purposes. 
And so you're interested in her, and you kind of give her a wink here, just like, okay, okay, all right, see. Now, our response to God, the woman really does decide. You know, uh, in the Hallmark movies, they, you know, they, they don't necessarily click right away, and the guy keeps going, or this and that. And he, but male ego is pretty rough, you know. It's, uh, we, we don't have strong male ego, so we need signals that this is a good thing to happen. So can you give him a signal that this is a good thing to happen? Okay, there we go. There's the signal. So grace is what God gives to us. Faith is what we give to God. Now, the next verse, it says, not willing that any should perish, but, uh, excuse me, it says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And some people say, it's faith plus nothing, minus nothing. You can't add anything to it. And that only thing right there, faith, is what saves you, and don't try to do anything else in there, or you will be wrong. And that's kind of what we're going to try to unpack tonight. And I want you to give this couple who volunteered willingly... A great hand. It's incredible. They did good. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, you'll never argue in anyone into the kingdom, I don't think. I will say that again. You will never argue anyone into the kingdom, I don't think. Maybe someone has been argued into the kingdom, but I've, I, I don't know who it is. Uh, usually we befriend people, and we, uh, and we answer the questions in a way that's non-threatening, and also we listen to them. We hear their story, and then we are gracious about their story, and then um, we tell our story. I was sitting on a plane, um, coming here, in fact, uh, next to a young man who was uh, a Catholic, and he was doing the rosary and this and that. We got talking, um, and it turns out he was on a spiritual journey and had asked the Lord to give him someone to talk to. So that was kind of cool. Uh, and we got talking, and then he asked me, "Well, what do you think about what do you think about Mary? What do you think about Mary?" Well, I could have told him what I thought about Mary. That might have ended the conversation. Sometimes you need to work very hard not to put roadblocks in the way that people are. Uh, I said, well, she's very important in the, in the Gospel of John, and I cited a couple of instances, and then he just took off with it. And Had I had time, I would have said she was important in the book of Acts, too. In Acts, well, she got the Holy Ghost, but we didn't make it that far. And then we, we went out and we... Well, everyone's waiting for their bags, you know, like they check them. It's a little plane. He and I, they're praying. It was like a coolest thing. Um, and uh, he said, you pray for me and I will pray for you. And I said, I will pray for you. And I have been praying for him. His name is Isaac. But sometimes people ask you questions that uh, make it very difficult for you to, to answer. Uh, it's just one of those things, if you say one thing or another, it's going to wind up going bad. For example, next slide. Have you ever heard somebody ask a question that if you say yes or no, you're wrong? Are you still beating your wife? Because the presupposition is in the question. It's that you have been, now are you still doing it? And so sometimes you get a question like that. Why aren't you a man, man, man? Or why don't you believe man, 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 man? And the question is phrased in such a way that it means, why are you wrong? How did you happen to be so wrong? How does that work? Uh, so the question, and I'm going to get to it in a little bit, that's asked that has the presupposition in it, and, and I'll, I'll kind of let the cat out of the bag uh, even before the slide comes up, is this question, and you may not recognize it as one, one of those sort of questions, but it really is. At what moment are you saved? At what punctiliar moment are you saved? What, when is that? 
Is it when you repent? Is it when you're baptized? When you get the Holy, Holy Ghost? Well, is it when you have faith? That's what I believe. I believe, you know, for, from the foundation of the world, God's on when I have faith, and there is, and that's what it is. At what moment are you saved? All right, so uh, flip to the next slide, and I'll talk you through how we do business um, theologically. Um, there's a big word in the Bible. We have an Old Testament, and we have a New Testament. Another word for testament is covenant. Another word for testament is covenant. And um, covenant is, is a powerful word, and it's a big word. And you, are, you can enter into covenant, um, but it's not quite the same as a legal contract. You know, we, we say this, when you sign on the dotted line, then that makes it done. Uh, that's a legal contract. But covenants take a bit of time to accomplish. So, for example, in the Old Testament, if you were going to get into covenant, you had to offer a sacrifice. And there were prescribed things that you had to do. And it didn't take long, but it took a bit of time for you to do all those things. And I'll give you a big word, uh, because what would a Bible study be without a big word? This is the big word. It's liminality. The word liminal, and we'll add an ending to it, liminality. You say, what is that? Well, um, and this is an original with me. Uh, there's a guy by the, David, by the name of David McCullough. He just wrote two books, and uh, the, the books essentially argue for tongues as the evidence for the Holy Spirit and as the Holy Spirit as being in covenant. And he's not a one that's Pentecostal. But I've got to be a friend with him. He's at He says it's like going through the front door. You pick up your foot. You're raising it. You're coming down. When are you in the door? You know, is it, are you halfway in? He says it takes time. If you try to think of it as a single moment second, then you'd be wrong. But liminality is how you take one step and then another and then you're in. And so he says that's the way the New Testament operates. Um, so some people say, well, what is it? How do you parse that? And by the way, I'm going to stop about 10 minutes to 8. And any question you have in the whole world, any question at all, you can ask me and I will answer it, even if the answer is I have no idea. Okay, so 10 to 8, that's where we're going to do the Q&A. Uh, there is a Baptist theologian by the name of Robert Stein, and he basically said this, which is pretty odd for a Baptist theologian, but he's very well respected, teaches at their uh, finest seminary. Now, I think he's uh, emeritus now, but uh, he wrote a number of books. And he said, you can't separate belief from confession, from baptism, from the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says it's all one big package. Now, how about that for a Baptist? He says in the New Testament, they all went together. And that's kind of where we're going to try to get here with this. Um, let's suppose you were going to a wedding and... Um, Wow, that's a cute picture. That really is a cute picture. Well, let me do it another way. The Old Testament was looking forward to the New Testament. And the New Testament is the age of the Spirit, the age of the Spirit. It would be inaugurated by the Messiah, which is Jesus. When you ask the question, what was Jesus' mission? You only have to go to the guy who is introducing him to find the answer, and that was John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist said this, I'm baptizing you with water, but the one who's coming after me, the one who I'm supposed to introduce to you, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit, and in Luke would say, and fire. 
Now, it doesn't say it one time. It says that at the beginning of Matthew. It says at the beginning of Mark. It says at the beginning of Luke. It says in the book of John. And it also says it twice in the book of Acts. So if something is repeated in every single gospel and twice in the book of Acts, you might suspect that would be an important thing, right? I would. How many people did Jesus baptize with the Holy Spirit during his earthly so, um, it's rhetorical. I'll answer, I'll answer the question. But how many people did people did Jesus baptize with the Holy Ghost during his earthly ministry? Well, uh, in John chapter seven, verse thirty-seven, the last day, great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, "If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow." Rivers of living water. And then John, parenthetically, says in verse 39, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him will receive. The Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He hadn't died, been buried, resurrected, glorified. That doesn't happen till the birthday of the church in the book of Acts. So if you want to know... Even though he's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Even though John is baptizing, and even though all those things are going on in the gospel, nobody yet receives the Holy Ghost. Amen. Um, now, again, people ask, what do you believe about salvation? I mean, how are you saved? I mean, what is, it, is, it, is it repentance? Is it a faith? I believe in faith. Faith plus nothing, minus nothing, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That sort of thing. Well, let me just say a couple things about that first. Uh, Titus 3.5, uh, it's not according to our works. He saved us. Um, it's by his mercy, by his grace, uh, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Scholars will tell you that's, that's initiation in the church, washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't considered a work. It wasn't considered a work for Paul. Um, so you go to a wedding, and uh, can you flip to the next slide? Let me see what that looks like. There we go. That's the slide I'm looking for. So you're at a wedding, and somebody comes up to you, and uh, they say, psst, psst. You're, you're a lady in the wedding, you're in the back, you're trying to usher the bridesmaid in, you're trying to keep people out. And they, they, they come and they have this in, important question. You think, well, something must be wrong. And this guy says, I have a question for you. And you say, well, what, what, what is it? And he says, I have to know something. When are they married? Excuse me? When are they married? Sir, the wedding's going on. This is important. I need to know this right now. When are they married? Well, what are you talking about? He says, is it when they say, I do? Is it when they said you can kiss the bride? Is it when he pronounces a man and wife? Is it when they sign the license? Is it when the courthouse receives the license? Is it when it's sexually consummated? When are they married? And she's thinking, who let this guy in here? Is he on drugs or what? Because it's all of them together. 1 Corinthians 6.11 is an important verse. In verse 9 it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then in verse 11 it says, and such were some of you. Now, the verbs here are in the aorist tense. Scholars tell us it's talking about one event. But you were washed. They say that's baptism. You were sanctified. You were justify how in the name of the lord jesus christ and by the spirit of our god it all goes together it's one whole experience amen it's one whole experience all right so i need my umbrella 
because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I hope you're getting ready to ask questions or have texted those in because I'm going to start early, I think, on the questions. So this is what Stein says. Um, and I need a volunteer to come. This is much easier. To come and hold the umbrella for me. I just need one volunteer. Yes, please come. Hallelujah. The volunteers are coming by the thousands, by the millions, and they're coming now. No, it's good. This is what you need to know. That when the Bible says faith, it's not just talking about uh, a punctiliar moment, intellectual faith. Um, my seminary professor did the, um, the article in, in the dictionary, Greek dictionary, on faith, and she says in the Old Testament there's, there's no such thing as just mere intellectual faith. It always implies doing. And not only that, in the New Testament as well, the word faith is the same way. It's got the Semitic meaning, and it means doing stuff. So faith always implies obedience. So sometimes when you read the book of Acts, it's a narrative, uh, it'll only mention one thing or another thing. It just says they were baptized, or it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost, or it says they had faith, or it, it says um, they confessed. And according to what scholars are telling us today, according to David McCullough, the guy I was telling you, he says, the pattern set in Acts 2, uh, it's the Holy Spirit, it's seen and heard, it's associated with tongues. Anytime you hear any of those words, those words, one word, stands for it all. So faith, I want to lean down there. We've got to spell this right. This is cool. We had help on this afternoon. They were working uh, vigorously on this. Brother Billy, thank you. You can put it back up, straight up. But when it says faith, it implies this, repentance. It's not taking away repentance. If you have faith, you'll do what God asks you to do. You'll turn from your wicked ways. You'll do what pleases the Lord. The Bible says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But it's the same as when Paul often says, we're talking about faith. He's, it's an umbrella term talking about conversion, new birth, uh, being born again. And it also implies this, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, thank you very much. You did a good job. Let's give him a hand. I'm going to continue in the same vein next week, but let me just summarize what we've said and kind of bring it to a close, well, and then I'll handle your questions. And again, your question can be kind of go off this the way and the other way um, from this. The Bible speaks of grace. That's God's love toward us, reaching out to us. It appears to everyone. It, our response to him is faith. Faith is not a simple act of faith. It's a commitment for relationship, and it's the beginning of a walk toward covenant. Then we talked about um, how all of these other elements are important. Confession. Confession usually took place at baptism. That's an important element. Oh, you want to flip to the next slide for me? Um, five ways to talk about conversion. This is Pauline. It's also in Acts. Believing, that's equivalent. That's equivalent to faith. Faith, believing, receiving, confessing, um, making a public profession of faith, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and being filled with the Spirit. Those are, we can, they might list two or three. They might list one. They might list uh, list maybe four out of five, but they're all in the same range of meaning to talk about what it means um, to come to the Lord. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there and go for questions. Uh, if there are no questions, I'm going to continue teaching on whatever I jolly will, please. But yes, I think we got some. All right, here we go. There's questions. So, um, again, there's a lot of questions. Um, when Elizabeth and Zechariah um, filled with the Holy Ghost in Luke 
chapter 1. So weren't Elizabeth and Zechariah filled with the Holy Ghost in Luke chapter 1? Yes, thank you for that question. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.21 that holy men of uh, old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is present even in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, but it's not present in the same way as the kingdom of God, where it's the age of the Spirit. And so they were literally under the Old Testament. In Luke 7, 28, Jesus said, Of all the prophets born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Why are we greater than John? Because we have the Spirit in a way that he could not have it. And again, John 7, 39, the Spirit was not given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So it was an Old Testament sense of prophecy. goes along with that when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said receive ye the Holy Ghost some people interpret that as them receiving the Holy Ghost in that instant as well yes um, well flip the page one page and he tells them in Acts chapter 1 go to Jerusalem so you can get the Holy Ghost be endued with power from on high so in the Greek the word pneuma is wind spirit breath he's foreshadowing what the Holy Ghost is and is about to do Okay, just a, a few more. In Daniel, if the king was not religious, how did he know it was the son of God? And I'm assuming this is the fourth man in the fire. Yes, fourth man in the fire. Well, uh, Elohim is uh, a uniplural word for God. And that king knew God, and he knew gods. Some translation would say this is the son of the gods. Um, he, he, he had no idea. He was not saying this is the second person of the Trinity or this is Jesus Christ somehow come or, or whatever. He was simply saying this is a divine manifestation. Uh, and so that wasn't his meaning in terms. Again, some will translate that son of the gods. Yeah. Uh, so an angelic figure, something like that. They had a whole hierarchy of spiritual beings. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a, a, a few more here. Um, if we are supposed to believe in Jesus to be saved, what did he say about salvation? If we're supposed to believe in Jesus to be saved, what did he say about yeah. salvation? A lot. <laughs> uh, in the prologue of John, uh, some pivotal verses are verses 11 and 12. Um, the book of John is about two things, about the group of people that should have believed in him and didn't, and about that remnant group who did believe. So um, you have John 1, 11, he came to the world, of oh, John 1, 10, he was in the world and the world did not know him. John 1, 11, but his, um, he came to his own, his own did not receive him, verse 12, but as many as received him to them, he, he gave the power to become or the right to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. Um, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of men, but the will of God. Now, verse 12 and 13 of the same Gennaro word is used for receiving. It's also used for make. It's also used for being born. Who were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of men, but of God. So here's Jesus now. Nicodemus comes to him by night, and he's, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And he's expecting Jesus to say, well, and you're a teacher too. And so, uh, and all the respectful things. Jesus cuts to the chase. He knows why he's there. He says, uh, most assuredly I say to you, uh, unless you're born anothane, gene anothane, born again, you cannot see the kingdom. And go, oh, how can a man be born when he's old and enter the second time his mother's womb will be born? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you're born of the water, born, same as the prologue, this is Jesus talking, the water and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I just picked one scripture. Everything you read in the Gospels is about salvation. So there's a lot there. Uh, but Jesus certainly did uh, die for our sins. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Okay, uh, just a, a few more here. Would you say that you are saved when you are forgiven or vice versa or neither? Okay, when somebody says to me, are you saved when you have faith? I say yes. Are you saved when you repent? I say yes. Are you saved when you're baptized? Yes. 
Are you saved when you get the Holy Ghost? Yes. Well, which is it? Yes. It's all of it. Now, here's the deal. When you meet someone, don't belittle their experience. If someone has confessed Christ, say, well, thank God. That's so wonderful. Always we've got something more to offer. If you meet a Muslim, well, thank God you believe in one God. That's so special. And you, you have morals. And, 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 and I, I think that's so special. But we have more to offer. So start where people are and then help them to know more. All right, here's a, a little lengthier question. I know it isn't entirely related, but I've read yours and Brother Bernard's books. Judaism does not claim to be in Trinity, yet the early church seems to, and these would, he would mention, or whoever it is, Tertullian, Oregon, uh, et cetera. Jesus obviously has verses where he addresses the Father as an individual, yet he also talks about being in the same essence of the Father. What do you make of persons of the Trinity? Different roles, such as one can be both a father, son, and a husband, or something else. Well, thank you for that question. That's a, that's a great question. So, um, two things Jesus is, and this is the incarnation. This is the paradox of the incarnation. I'm uh, writing a book on the Christology of John. And the first thing you need to know is that... Um, he is claiming to be the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Seven times in the book of John, he is, uh, without a predicate, has I am statements. It goes back to uh, when Moses was at the burning bush, and he says, I am. It's Yah, Sher Yah. It's basically um, uh, uh, the same word as Yahweh or Jehovah. And Jesus, seven times in John, says, uh, I am. Seven times he says it with a predicate. I am the life, I am the truth, blah, blah, blah. Ego and me in the Greek. So he's claiming to be um, the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Secondly, he's also, and this is where sometimes people miss, he's claiming to be a man who has a God. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is claiming to be a man who has a God. The Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4, it's called the Shema. In Hebrew, the first word is here, Shema Israel, Yahweh Elheinu, Yahweh God. It, it's the most important verse in the entire Old Testament. In the New Testament, there is a corollary scripture found in 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there's one God, and then it says there's one mediator or mesites between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So when you read such things in John chapter uh, 5, and uh, where Jesus is speaking in uh, verse 19, he says this, very, uh, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. Uh, and what he does, the Son also does in like manner. Like, what, what, what? I've been reading all kinds of Trinitarian books, and they struggle with the book of John and the Gospels entirely, because how in the world can a co-equal person tell another co-equal person what to do and why is he praying and so on and so forth? And how they come about it in the end is, well, it must be his flesh that was praying. And that's when I say, I agree. I don't know if that answered it. Okay? Yeah, no, and I think that question in the coming weeks is going to be even more talked about. Yes, we, we are going to have an entire session on uh, Jesus Christ. Does holiness complete salvation or protect salvation? Yes, yes, and yes. All right, well, that's scripture that we said. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you're washed, you are sanctified, you're justified. The word sanctified there means made holy. So let's say someone walks in tonight or any night, here's the pastor preach, and uh, they feel remorse and they want to serve the Lord. They're crying and, and uh, so they talk to someone and they decide to get baptized and then they get baptized. And uh, let's say they're a terrible person. 
They kick their dog. They're mean to their wife. They don't like their kids. They don't round up at McDonald's. <laughs> Nothing good. Axe murder, whatever it is that makes them a myrtle, terrible person. When they go, let's say they're full of metal piercings or on drugs or whatever, whatever you can do to make them not holy. And they go down in the water in the name of Jesus and they come up and they start speaking in other tongues. Here's my question. Now it's rhetorical. I'll answer it myself. Are they holy? According to 1 Corinthians 6, 11, they are holy. You're washed, you're sanctified, you're made holy. You're justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. Now, there are three kinds of holiness. There is imputed holiness. That's what just happened. You were made holy. You say, well, they haven't paid tithes yet. Well, they might still have problems. Oh, whose righteousness are we talking about? Ours or the righteousness of Jesus that's imputed on us? The next level, though, is be what you've been made. This is progressive holiness. Just take one step, another step, another step, another step. So I've been made holy, and I'm not as though I'd already attained. Either we're already perfect, but I, I press toward the mark. We're trying to be more like the Lord. The final holiness is when we see him face to face. We're going to be like him, for we see him as he is, uh, and that is what I'm looking forward to. Yes, more questions. King Hezekiah asked to be healed and live longer. God then granted him 15 more years. Was it God's will all along for him to live longer? Or did God's compassion cause him to change his mind? You might have to ask God that one. I can give you a theory, but it might not be right. I'm not going to die on this hill, but I'll just give you my theory. I don't even tell him to give you my theory. I'll give it to you, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not even 51% sure of this, so it might not be right. Uh, I think we can, we often pray, Lord, not your will, but mine be done. We use different words than that. But that's what we mean. Now, Hezekiah would have been a lot better off if he didn't have those, that son that turned out to be so wicked. So was that a reason why he shouldn't have prayed for more time? Or was that a separate issue or what? I mean, in hindsight, we go, you should have just died. You would have been better off. But um, I, I, I don't know. Oh. I used to be a better expert on the will of God than I am now. Uh, I used to know everything about the will of God. The older I get, the less I'm sure about that. I just know God's good, and I want to do what he wants me to do. All right, sorry about that. That's all I got on that one. Uh, just one more. We're getting close to time. Uh, someone come back and said, um, I'll just read the question. You didn't, you didn't seem to actually answer or respond. Can you be saved without speaking in tongues? There are more spiritual gifts than just tongues. You mentioned baptism. So are tongues just an evidence of being saved rather than the evidence? Okay. Just ain't evidence? So this is a great setup for next week because that is what I'm going to go into next week. And also, if you want a preview of what I'm going to speak on, you are going to buy this book from the bookstore if there are any left. There, I think there's like half a dozen left. And uh, I promise that next week... That will be the, the main kind of focus of what we're doing. So uh, we will not let that go. And that's a great question. And it's really important to know the difference between spiritual gifts and how tongues ap uh, operates in the book of Acts. So it's my delight to be here with you. Uh, what a wonderful church. And thank you. Uh, just I have enjoyed it already. I'm looking forward to a great month.